Good morning, David. Thank you for coming in today. Um, I believe you wanted to talk about um, assistance dogs in the UK and perhaps what's going on with those at the moment. Well, I would, Ross. Uh, firstly, thank you very much indeed for inviting me here. I really do appreciate it because this is a very important issue for many more people than ever most seem to realise. The current situation is that we have got a number of major charities that spend a great deal of money training people and assistance dogs to help them. Whether it is people who are blind, people who can't hear very well or not at all, uh, people who need help with a disability because they're in a, a, a wheelchair, and they, those charities, I have, to, um, I have to make it clear, do a marvellous job. But there is a problem. There's a problem in that there are people who fall through the cracks. They're people who need an assistance dog for their mental comfort, for companionship. Uh, they are just as important and they still, they, those people are classified as disabled. But there is only one charity which tries to help those people and they are unbelievably stretched. Um, AID, Dogs AID, which is, will, will help people who wish to train their own dogs and they will um, uh, appoint trainers to, to help them. So when you're talking about assistance dogs, obviously you've mentioned the larger charities and things perhaps we're all more familiar with like guide dogs for the blind and hearing dogs for deaf people, but you're also including in this the use of perhaps dogs that, sort of emotional support dogs, people that have various um, emotional disorders or... Correct. No, that's exactly right. It's, it's, it's those people who need emotional support, uh, support for a mental disability. There are people whose dogs can be trained to um, uh, anticipate uh, uh, physical problems such as, a, uh, as an epileptic fit. All those people are classified as disabled formally in law, but there is there are very few opportunities for those people to become, to have assistance dogs that are recognised by society. Yes. So if a guide dogs for the blind um, uh, is, is on the street, they have a jacket and they have a logo. And the, um, the big charities have formed a, a working group called the um, uh, Assistance Dogs UK, which represents them. And they work very closely with government um, to ensure that their charitable status and the dogs that have been trained by them are recognised and they can go on aircraft and they can go on buses and they can go into shops. But you have this large group of um, dogs which are either self-trained or trained by another trainer to help the person who, who needs assistance but who don't have any recognition. So as it stands now, the dogs that perhaps, as you say, are self-trained, so there have been cases whereby dogs will alert owners to epileptic seizures before they occur and things like that. that. Is right. In the event that a dog starts to do that and isn't trained by medical detection dogs, for example, what, um, how would somebody now go about getting that registered as an assistance dog in order that they can take the dog into the bank or supermarkets and, and have well, that is Well, that is the key problem. There is no process other than those controlled by the big charities where a registration of an assistance dog can take place. Now there have been efforts to try and find a way through and uh, the Department of Work and Pensions, which has got an, um, a department of its own called the Office of Disability, have been trying to do that. And they have been working with some trainers which unfortunately, in my opinion, um, have begun to produce criteria which are condescending, which are very basic. Um, clearly, a dog that's an assistance dog will be companionable. Mm -hmm. You don't have to test for companionability. You do have to test whether the dog can behave properly in going up an aircraft steps, for instance, or going onto a bus. But you, don't have to, you don't have to have any evidence that it's companionable and it can be stroked, not that one would want to stroke a dog that was no. actually working, but nevertheless, um, the, the criteria were so extensive and so complicated, the costs of anybody who needed an assistance dog um, being able to fulfil those criteria was just immense. 
Now, the Department of Work and Pensions have agreed that, and they've stopped working on it, and now it's been taken up by the British Standards Institution, and they want to set a British standard for assistance dogs to which anybody can apply. And who are they working with now? They're working, They're with, big... working with the big charities, right, yeah. which the Department of Work and Pensions was working with, so we don't appear to have any outside input from really experienced dog trainers in this separate area of emotional, mental support um, who are involved in it. And I, I just feel the whole thing is becoming um, choked up with administration and bureaucracy, which is not going to do anybody any favours. We need something simple, which I know organisations such as the uh, Pet Education Training and Behaviour Council could provide, which is simple, straightforward, and would enable these people to register their dogs quickly and simply. I wish that were happening, but I'm afraid it is not. And is there anything that we can do about that? Uh... It is a complicated issue. Don't misunderstand me. I, I realise that. But I, th I think that it is possible to, to um, develop a set of criteria which is simple, straightforward, that people can go through a, uh, a, a trainer who can simply sign off the dog as being mm -hmm. suitable. Yeah. Doesn't have to have, they don't have a long, complicated tick boxes, pages and pages. So taking everything into consideration, Ross, we need a simple, straightforward way in which dogs, which are not formally trained by, and, and people, who are not formally trained by the big charities, can fulfil a simple set of criteria which would enable them to be registered as an assistance dog so that it will be recognised um, by uh, airlines, bus companies, shops. I find it difficult to see quite how we would do that, but I just know in my head and my heart that it should be possible without getting into a huge amount of bureaucracy. There are organisations already for dog trainers and canine behaviour practitioners um, that are membership bodies, so definitely looking at the use of sort of the Canine and Feline Behaviour Association or the Guild of Dog Trainers. They have skilled dog trainers already and often we do lots of um, lots of temperament tests, lots of training analysis anyway, just by the very nature of what we do. So when we look at pets as therapy, so dogs that go and visit in care homes or visit schools, they already undergo assessments with qualified dog trainers to assess their suitability to do those tasks. We have the Kennel Club Good Citizen Dog Test and things we're used to assessing dogs behaviour out in public places. So of course we could use those, the bodies that we have already of professional dog trainers and canine behaviourists to assess these dogs and to ensure that they meet that criteria, that they are safe and they are able to fulfil the role that their handler needs them to fulfil and function safely in the society. Well, that is very interesting because, of course, Pets and Therapy, which I was involved with uh, many years ago, has already fulfilled all those criteria. So yeah. you don't need to have another set of tick boxes to go over to make sure a dog is suitable. You mentioned earlier on um, Dog Aid, Assistance in Disability. Um, they're one of the charities at the moment that are enabling people to train their own dogs with the support of one of their trainers to um, qualify the dog as an assistance dog so it can accompany them into, into places where pet dogs aren't able to go. Are they training um, emotional support dogs or are they just dealing with dogs that support people with physical disability? Yes, they are. And I'm, I must say I've been very impressed with the work that they've done. They're based in Sheffield, but they have some trainers throughout the country. Um, the thing is, they don't have enough money or enough trainers that have been trained in their way of doing things to get to get it done to fulfil the re requirements. They've got they've they've trained eighty dogs as emotional support dogs, mm -hmm. and, but they've got I think one hundred and forty at the last count that are, are waiting. So we've got to find a simpler way of doing it that doesn't go through that the, the charitable bureaucracy, which is inevitably part of the the big the big charities. Yeah. I mean, as you say, it seems really that there is a fairly simple solution to it if we can get people on board, people to assess these dogs and for people to agree on a standard. That is what I'm looking for. I'm sure it is possible, but unfortunately, by getting involved with government and by getting involved with the British Standards Institution, there will inevitably be a huge amount of paperwork and back out and checking, which for an emotional support dog that is 
is companionship is the key issue is really quite unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, at the moment in the news, we're, we're all very aware of mental health, aren't we? It's something we now that we all talk about and that we should be talking about. And dogs, as pet owners will know, can have a, a huge emotional um, benefit. Um, so it's something really that we should be looking at to, to conclude quite soon, isn't it? Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, we know that there's a huge amount of scientific evidence that says that dogs are good for people. How much more important and valuable are they for people who are vulnerable? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's hope that this can be, we can reach a conclusion fairly promptly. Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, I've, I've got first-hand experience of um, numerous assistance dogs, actually. My mother is a wheelchair user, and she's had, a, she, she's now on her third assistance dog. And for people that aren't aware how life-changing these dogs can be, people think that it's, you know, it's just a dog in a jacket that you're able to take into a supermarket. Um, when my mother got her first dog, she was living on her own and life was incredibly difficult for her. Daily tasks were impossible. And actually the, the physical support that the dog gives her was incredible. But equally the emotional support and the confidence mm. to go out shopping in the supermarket because you've got your companion with you, haven't you? Exactly. Where it makes things so much easier. And I think what you're saying is that we could be supporting a whole lot more people, enabling people to function better in society, having better quality of life, if it wasn't for all of this bureaucracy that people have to jump through. Absolutely. I really do appreciate having the opportunity to explain some of those things. Thank you. Lovely, and thank you for coming. Pleasure.